Hey guys, uh, good evening. My name is Steve Kyle. I'm an elder here at the bridge. Uh, we're going to be looking at 1 Peter chapter 2 tonight. First we'll pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Um, the exciting records that we're going to read tonight about Peter and the doctrine of the epistle, but also all of the things that led up to being able to write this epistle and all the things that Peter experienced with your son Jesus Christ while here on earth as well as in the early church. Thank you for the light that your word um, gives to our paths. We ask for your guidance as to what we should hear and how we should implement what we hear so that we are better Christians. And I thank you for these men. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Okay, okay so uh, we're going to look at First Peter. But before we actually look at First Peter chapter 2, I am sure that all of you, as um, boys, young men, perhaps even later in life, had formative events or formative people in your lives. And we're going to look at some of those because 1 Peter and 2 Peter, 1 and 2 Peter were written probably near the end of Peter's life. Peter was traditionally, we don't know this for sure, Peter was traditionally martyred, actually crucified, upside down, by his request because he didn't want to die in the same way that Jesus Christ did. Now, there's no biblical record of that, so I'm not, that's not a chapter and verse thing, but traditionally he was martyred. Um, but First and Second Peter don't just appear on the scene out of nowhere. They came out of Peter and all of the things that formed Peter during the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ, during the early church, and then First and Second Peter as epistles are written near the end, and he's not even in Jerusalem. He's in Babylon, for heaven's sake, when he writes the epistles, right? So, we're going to look at just some, uh, and we're going to be reading a fair amount of scripture. Most of them I have overheads for, but we're going to look at a number of events before we even read for Peter chapter 2. And this is, again, formative events. Think back in your own lives about people that were influential in terms of why you are the way you are now. Either negatively or positively, or events that were formative. Things that happen that you can recall. Remember the time period between the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ that starts, depending on how you decide how long his ministry was, something like 30 AD, right? So most people date First and Second Peter about 60 AD or roughly at about the end of the book of Acts period. So we're talking about 30 years there, right? When Peter, the fisherman from Galilee, his godliness, his Christianity was formed during those times, both with Jesus Christ personally, as well as all the things that happened in the early church, and we'll talk about some of those things. So, let's start by looking at a few records from the Gospels. So, you may know this from when you read the Gospels, and we're just going to, again, just read some of these records. Peter wasn't, <laughs> he didn't respond positively the first time Jesus said, follow me. Yeah, if you knew that about but he did. In any case, let's read John 1, 35 and 42. And you can either read this in your translation or up here. This is King James. So this is the, of course, the holy translation. You can use something <laughs> else if you like. However, okay. again, the day after, John stood and two of his disciples and looked upon Jesus as he walked. He said, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following, and said unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted master, where dwellest thou? He says unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt, and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Now, so we know Andrew was a disciple of John the Baptist. And he's one of the two that decides to follow Jesus. And then Andrew goes and gets Peter, right? <clears throat> He first finds his own brother. And he brought him to Jesus, and when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. I don't always know what to make of the name change. Now, one thing we see from there is, this is one of the few places, I think maybe one of two places, when the name of Simon Peter's father is mentioned. His mom is never mentioned. Uh, that's a, yeah, no, his, his mother-in-law is healed by Jesus, but not, his own mother is not mentioned in the gospel. Um, and I only point that out because one reference work that I looked at relative to 
just Simon Peter in general in his life, um, indicated that he was actually probably raised by James and John's parents. That is, you know, James and John, the two disciples, uh, apostles. So, Andrew, Peter, James, and John, at least quite possibly, if not likely, grew up together. Right? And they end up being four of the apostles. Let's go on. So this is the second call now. Right? The first time we just read about This is the second one. It's in Luke chapter 5. And you know these things because Luke chapter 5, by this time, the temptations had taken place in Luke chapter 4 and Matthew chapter 4. Jesus Christ had started his public ministry in Luke 4, 16 when he stands up. And then you may remember he stands up in the temple and he reads Isaiah 61. You know, and then he says to them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. That's the beginning of his public ministry. Right. Anyway, so this happens after that. And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and talked to people on the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draw. Or draft. Um, and Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have tiled, toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word I will let down the net. Now, and we'll finish this and then I'll, I'll make sure you understand a distinction in these verses. And when they had done, and when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their men break. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships, so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him at the draft of the fishes which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. Now, I just want to point out one thing in this record. And again, this was the second kind of major interaction with Peter and Jesus. Right? But here, and your a more modern translation may translate, um, possibly translate it differently. But when he says, Master, we have and I have taken nothing, nevertheless, at thy order, I will take, let down the net. Sing. Right? But what did um, Jesus say in verse 4? Now when he had left speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets. Right. So Jesus said, put them all out there. Peter said, you know what? I've been doing this all my life. I just got finished fishing all night and I got nothing. All right, I'll put up one net. That was his response to what Jesus Christ said. And that is a valid translational distinction. The first one is plural. The second one is singular. Right. And then, look what he does. Uh, let down the net. So when they did this, they closed a great moment of fishes and their net. Great. So he says, put out a bunch. He puts out one. What happens? It breaks. They still get a bunch of fish, but it breaks. <laughs> Partial blessing. Yeah. Anyway, so again, when we read these records, think of this as formative, right? These are formulating Peter's idea of Jesus Christ, his, uh, his own godliness. This is... This is Peter before we see him write 1st and 2nd Peter. This is how Peter got to be Peter. And this is the third time it's called. Sort of. This is when he was actually appointed as an apostle. Because the first, remember like in Luke 5 and in John 1, there were just a bunch of disciples. Jesus Christ didn't choose 12 until later. Right? So Luke chapter 6, verses 12 and 14, It came to pass in those days that he, Jesus Christ, went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. First of all, Peter sees that. He sees that Jesus Christ spends all night in prayer. Right? <clears throat> and when it was day, he called unto his disciples, and of them he chose twelve, whom he also named apostles, Simon, whom he also named Peter, and his brother, James and John, Philip of Bethlehem, and then he called the name. But Simon was the first one. Now, the record of, this is another formative event, walking on water. Right? And this is before, we don't get to the point that Jesus Christ <coughs> as the Messiah. to the point of telling them about his passion until Matthew 16. He doesn't actually start to tell them, I'm going to 
I'm going to suffer, I'm going to die, I'm going to rise from the dead. He doesn't even tell him that until Matthew 16. So here, and it's not until Matthew 16, which we're going to read, that Jesus Christ says, Who do the people think I am? And uh, Elijah, one of the prophets, Jeremiah, who do you think I am? Peter's first one to the You're Christ, the Son of the living God. From that point, it says in the record, from that point, Jesus Christ starts to tell him about his passion. That hadn't happened yet when we read this record. Peter was still forming an opinion of who Jesus was. Okay. Anyway, this, and I, we're not going to look at the details of this record, but this record is absolutely electric. Man, it's just fantastic. But you need to study details, which we're not going to take the time to go into tonight. I'll mention a couple things, but it is just absolutely electric. When you look at where they were in the ocean, there's another parallel record in John that talks about how far away from the, the shore they actually were, how far Jesus Christ actually walked on the water, what he did all night before that. This is like, because this is like three in the morning when this happens. Oh, it's just an amazing record. Anyway, Peter answered and said, uh, Lord, if you mean that, Jesus is is walking up there, you know, they say, first they say, ah, it's a ghost! He says, no, that's me. So, Peter answered and says, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come into the end of the water. And he said, he said, come. When Peter was coming down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind voices, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. Now, a couple things. Number one, obvious things. Peter was the only one who even offered to walk in the water. The other 11, at that point, the other 11, get right in that boat, number one. Number two, when he starts to sink, how far down do you think he was? How long does it take to sink? How long does it take your foot to get to the pavement when you step on the puddle? <laughs> Not long. And however, however far down he was, in verse 31, immediately, Jesus Christ had to respond immediately. He stretched out his hand and caught him. And that caught, we can, we can look at another time, but that's not just a, um, that's not just a, this kind of thing. It's a grab. And you can look at how that word is used elsewhere. But whatever, uh, however far down Peter was, Jesus Christ had to respond right away. Okay. And when they were, let's see, oh, that little faith wherefore did stop down. And we're not going to go into this, but not really a lot, but okay, so this is in the middle of the ocean, in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. Um, it's about it's 600 furlongs from shore. I don't remember the distance of a furlong. It's a good it's long eight distance. Eight What's that? Eight of them. A furlong? Eight of them. Really? Then I'm wrong about that number. It's in the parallel record in John. In any case, it's a distance from the shore. It's in the middle of the night. It's in a storm. It's dark. If you're Peter, and, and, and he's standing on water. Okay. He has every reason from the five senses to doubt. And yet, what Jesus Christ says to him, when they're still on the water, and he grabs him and lifts him up, he says to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Now, how do you think that formed Peter? <laughs> Just think about going through that. There was every reason to doubt for heaven's sake, but not from Jesus Christ's perspective. There was no reason to doubt at all. Not one. It didn't matter that they were in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, in the middle of the night, in the middle of the storm, on water. That didn't matter. And that word doubt is a great word which I encourage you to look at. It's only used twice, I think, in the New Testament. It's the Greek word distazo. And it literally means to stand at a fork in the road. It means you're standing right there and you can either go that way or you can go that way. That's what that word means. It's a great word. But think of this as a formative event for Peter. Because it gets to the point that he's the Peter that writes first and second Peter. These are all formative events. Matthew 16. We're just going to read this. I'm coming on a couple things on it. When Jesus came into the coasts of Caesarea to live by, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, and they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias. John the Baptist had been killed by this point. Uh, some Elias, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He says unto them, But whom say ye that I am? 
And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah. Bar-Jonah simply means son of Jonah. Right? His, his dad's name was Jonah. Son of Jonah. For flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, thou, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem, suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes, be killed, and be raised again the third day. First time he talks about this with his disciples. With his, with his apostles. First time. And they have to, he had to have the right answer to that question of, who do you think I am? Before he was going to tell them that. <clears throat> then, okay, so again, this is all formative for Peter. Now watch what happens. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. We'll read it. That's the next one. So, again, formula, right? Jesus, Peter goes from, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, to, Get thee behind me, Satan. All formative. All formative. Jesus Christ's ministry, you know, he talks about that we should love as he loved he, he says, you know, I want you to love each other like I love you. This is love. Right? Direct communication. Very direct communication. Frequently loving. Sometimes seemingly not. Very direct. So Peter goes from mountaintop to valley in this one time. Right? Man, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Get thee behind me, Satan. You're an offense unto me. So, on uh, the raising of Jairus, this happens earlier too, the raising of Jairus' daughter. Jairus was the, Jairus was the uh, uh, ruler, one of the rulers of the synagogue. He, uh, when he heals Jairus' daughter, which again, this record is just electric, because it contains in it the healing of the um, woman with the issue of blood. Uh, it's just, the details are just amazing. But we're just simply going to read. Uh, so we're in Mark chapter 5, verses 22 through 43. We're going to be reading a bit here. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he, Jairus, saw him, Jesus, he fell at his feet. And besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. And Jesus went with him, and much people followed him and thronged him. And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood 12 years, issue means just she was weak, constantly, you know, that's what that was. And had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing better, but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. Now the press is at least tens, maybe hundreds of people that are around Jesus, right? So she, <laughs> she somehow gets up next to Jesus and touched the stem of his garment. For she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. Now, an interesting little sidelight. The word uh, I may have mentioned to you before in Greek, there are a couple of different past tenses. There's one past tense that means just a simple past, you did something in the past. There's another past tense that means you did something repeatedly, right? Over and over and over again. So this word said, for she said, it's in that past tense. She was essentially, you can just see this woman crawling or somehow getting up to beside Jesus Christ, saying to herself, if I can just touch the hand of this car, if I can just touch the hand of this car. And that's what's happening on the way to Jairus' healing, to your daughter being healed. Peter is present for all this stuff. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. Jesus, immediately knowing him in himself that virtue had come out of him, virtue is 
strength, power. It's uh, dunamis. Turned him about in the press and said, who touched my clothes? Just imagine this. You know, Peter's looking on and tens or hundreds of people are around Jesus. And all of a sudden he turns around, who touched me? Are you kidding me? Everybody touched you. What are you talking about? Right? And that's the response. His disciples said to him, you see the multitude thronging me? You say, who touched me? And he looked around about to see the to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole, go in peace, and be whole of thy plague. While he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, Thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. And he suffered no man to follow him, save Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. He comes to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and sees the tumult, and then that wept and wailed greatly. And when he was come in, he said unto them, Why make ye this ado? And weep. The damsel is not dead, but sleeps. And they laughed him to scorn. But when he had put them all out, he takes the father and the mother of the damsel, and them that were with him, Peter, James, and John, and enters in where the damsel was lying. And he took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Talitha Kumi, which is being interpreted damsel, I say unto thee, arise. And straightway the damsel arose and walked, for she was of the age of twelve years. And they were astonished with a great astonishment. And he charged them straightly that no man should know it, and commanded that something should be given her to eat. I love that last detail. <laughs> he made sure she was taken care of. Not to mention the fact that they just got up from the dead. Which is a very, I make sure very hungry. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So, again, formative for Peter. He sees Jesus immediately go. He sees the woman with the issue of blood heal. He sees Jesus responding with, Dunamis has gone out of me. Who touched me? He sees all this, and then he's taken into the inner sanctum, if you will, where this 12-year-old girl is actually resurrected from the dead. This is the Peter that writes 1st and 2nd Peter, all formative. We'll glance through this, the transfiguration. Peter, James, and John were the only ones. <laughs> when you read this record, it's a great record. After six days, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, his brother, and brings them up into a high mountain park, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, one for Elias. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Now, for whom did God make that pronouncement? It wasn't for Jesus. It was for Peter, James, and John. <laughs> they were the only other human beings there. <laughs> so, God says, this is my beloved Son. Hear ye him. Specifically for those three. Um, this is, I included this because this is leading up to the time of Jesus Christ's passion. And this was just a tremendous act of service. So let's just simply read this record. This is the record of Washington Feet in John 13. Now before the Feast of the Passover, again, you know, the Feast of the Passover is when the passion events start. So this is just before all this stuff is going to start happening to Jesus Christ. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God, he rises from supper, lays aside his garments, takes a towel, girds himself, and after that he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Now, I'll remind you, you probably have heard, washing feet was a servant's task in Bible lands and in Bible times. The Messiah didn't have to do this, but he was showing them the nature of service. Again, formative event for Peter. 
This makes Peter the man. Then comes he to Simon Peter, and Peter says unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter says unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter says unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Now, it's a great thing about Peter that he said that at all. Because Peter was sort of like uh, ready, uh, let's see, how's that go? Ready, fire, aim. <laughs> in other words, he was ready to jump in with both feet right now. He was fully committed right now. He was the only one that got in that boat. He was the only one that said, Jesus, that's you. Let me walk in the water over to you. You didn't see the other 11 guys doing that. You didn't see anybody else talking to Jesus about washing them their feet. Sarah and Peter's the only one that says anything. Right? So he's like, okay, man. I'm in. Wash the whole thing. I'm good. Because that was Simon Peter. Um, why don't we stand for a moment, take like two minutes, and just, you know, shake hands with somebody if you need to get a drink of water, whatever. Just to take a little break. We're doing a lot of reading here. But I think it's important to see these events in the people like Two minutes now. Yeah, go. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Is the camera right now over here? I don't even know. Where's the camera? <laughs> They can hear me. How are you, sir? Good, man. Sir? 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 It's it's a wider angle than that. Oh good. I thought it was I thought it was zoomed in on, on you, but no, no, it's, no I, yeah. No, I no, thought no, it was no. over here more. No, I was I was I spoke on the truth. I can't imagine. <laughs> I cannot imagine that you would ever do that.
Jesus says unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise also said all the, uh, the, the disciples. Then he comes to Jesus with them into a place called Gethsemane, and says unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. So now he's going to go on beyond and pray. He takes these three guys. So they're within at least eye shot of seeing him pray alone. Right? Just these three guys. Peter being one of them. Formative event. Before the passion. Right? Before he's already told he's going to die. He's told him what's going to happen here. <clears throat> then says, in verse 38, Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Now, I don't know that they heard him. I can't say that they heard him. But they could see him because he brought them up near to where he was praying. And when verse 39 says he fell on his face, um, one artist, uh, North Carolinian artist, a fellow named Robert Doris, who illustrated biblical passages, illustrated this verse by showing Jesus Christ like this. On the ground. Okay? The reason I point that out is we never think, we have this picture, this European, uh, Caucasian Jesus picture of this, with the light behind his head. He was on his face before God. He was in the most um, exposed position in prayer that you could be. That was Jesus Christ. And Peter is watching this. He's seeing this. right? He's seeing the Messiah. He knows this guy's the Messiah. He already said that. He is seeing this guy on his face, praying that this doesn't happen. Can we possibly not do this? But I will do it if you want me to. He comes, at verse 40, and he comes unto the disciples, finds them asleep, and says unto Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The Spirit indeed is willing to put the flesh into you. And he went away the second time, and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, that will be done. And he came and found them asleep again. He woke them up. He fell asleep again, because it says again. So it's the second time. <clears throat> for their eyes were heavy and he left them and went away again and prayed the third time saying the same words then comes he to his disciples and says unto them sleep on now and take your rest behold the hour is at hand and the son of man is betrayed into the hands of sinners rise let us be going behold he is at hand that does betray me now Peter is, is a got a front row seat for this he hears Jesus Christ after the praying three times say, okay, it's time. Let's go. Front row seat. Um, this is when they're in the garden too. It's kind of um, parallel. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant. This is after the Roman soldiers come. And cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Then said Jesus unto Peter, put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? <clears throat> then the band and the captain and the officer of the Jews took Jesus and found him. Again, not only front row seat, but he has his native zeal to protect the Messiah. And he's going to do it with the only way he knows how to do it, and that is he's going to fight. He's going to take that sword out and he's going to fight. And he sees Jesus tell him to put it away, and then heals the guy's ear. And then those that betray him, those that come to get him, he goes with them. Front row seat. First hand, right there. Yeah. And again, think back on your own lives of you know, father, uncle, grandfather, teacher, coach. Something formed you. Something made you the way you are now. You didn't do it alone. Nobody does. Another record about the Passion. As Peter was beneath in the palace, this is after things are underway with the trial and moving toward crucifixion and so forth, 
As Peter was beneath in the palace, there cometh out one of the maids of the high priest. And when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked upon him and said, And thou also wast with Jesus of Nazareth. But he denied, saying, I know not. Neither understand I what thou sayest. And he went out into the porch and the cockpit. And a maid saw him again and began to, to, to say to them that stood by, This is one of them. And he denied it again. He said again to Peter, Surely thou art one of them, for thou art Galilean, and thy speech agrees thereto. You know, they had certain ways they pronounced, apparently, especially guttural letters in Aramaic. <laughs> the guttural letters. Galileans would pronounce them differently. It's like a southern accent in the United States. You can tell where somebody's from. You can tell if they're from Brooklyn. You can tell if they're from Maine. They can tell this guy's from Galilee. Right? But he began to curse and to swear, saying, I know not this man of whom you speak. Now, what do you think is going to be your plan right now? And the second time the cop grew, and Peter called to mind the word that Jesus said unto him, Before the cop grew twice, thou shalt be in Christ, and when he thought the wrong thing. Formative event. Um, one thing about that record in Mark, um, you see Mark mentioned at the end of First Peter, the epistle of First Peter, you see Mark mentioned. And people, students of the Bible, I'll say students of the Bible, um, generally feel that the book, the Gospel of Mark, probably was the first one written of the Gospel. And that it was probably written largely by Mark on the... Um, with the first-hand eyewitness accounts of Peter. And that he you know, sort of read through that gospel, so to speak. Now, what's amazing is that this is even in there. Because this doesn't reflect well on Peter at all. But he read it, he knew of it, and it was out there. He was okay with that. And that's an amazing statement just about Peter the man. That you just denied the Messiah three times, and you're going to let everybody for all eternity know that that's what you did? Because that's what he did. About the resurrection. First day of the week comes Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulcher, and sees the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Then she runs and comes to Simon Peter, and to the other disciple, whom Jesus loved, which was John. And says unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. Now, did she say he was resurrected? No. She said he was stolen. She didn't say he was resurrected. She thought they stole the body. Peter therefore went forth, and that other disciple, and came to the sepulchre. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter, came first to the sepulchre, stooped down, looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then comes Simon Peter following him, went into the sepulchre and seized the linen clothes alive. Now, you would never do that as a Jew because it's considered unclean. You would never go into the sepulchre. What does Peter do? Man, I'm in. I want to see right now. The napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple which came first to the sepulchre. He saw him leave. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went again, away again, and they went home. I just want to point out a couple of things um, relative to the resurrection. In uh, Mark 16, 7, this is when the angel appears to um, the, one of the women after the resurrection. And see what he says. But go your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he goes before you into Galilee. There shall you see him, as he said unto you. So he specifically mentions Peter. Peter has a front row seat to Jesus, essentially, Jesus Christ's entire ministry. Everything. And just think about that in terms of the Peter that it forms. 1 Corinthians 15.5 is great too. This is Paul's recounting all the resurrection appearances, so to speak. And, and he gets to it. And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. So he, Peter saw him first. Then the twelve. And you can bet that the resurrection appearances were not haphazard or random. 
Jesus Christ appeared in his resurrected body to exactly to whom he wanted to appear. And he wanted to appear to Cephas before the twelve. Uh, let's see. We're not going to read the one in John 21 because it is kind of long. It's a great, great record. And it's after Jesus Christ is resurrected from the dead. It's about them going fishing again. It's a great record. But it's a little long, so we won't read it tonight. I do encourage you to read it. It's a great record. Um, Peter's role in the early church. So now we're at the point of you know the, the passion, Jesus Christ's crucifixion, resurrection, ascension, all that's done. So this is... Jesus, or this is Peter's role in the early church now. And we see, and this is just kind of bits and pieces of Acts. Acts 2.14, Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifts up his voice and says to them, You men of Judea and all you that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. Now, first uh, sermon in the Christian church. But remember, later in the record, it specifically documents there were 3,000 people who were baptized. How many people do you think Peter was actually preaching to? And how did they hear him? Really? I mean, he, he must have been preaching at the top of his lungs. There was no such thing as a microphone. And 3,000 people, let's say that 50% of the people who were listening actually got baptized. That means he was preaching to 6,000. Okay. And it was the first sermon. It was, you know, not long before in John 19, I think it's in John 19, it says the disciples were behind closed doors for fear of the Jews. But by Acts 2, he's willing to stand up with the eleven and preach to 6,000, or <coughs> 2,000. He's willing to do that. Um, in Acts 3, Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have given by thee in the name of Jesus Christ and the answer which I up and walk. That's the healing of the lame man at the temple gate of Jerusalem. Acts 4.10, be it known unto you all. And he's talking to the religious elite here. And if you read this record, it's what's scary about this, where if you were in Peter's shoes, is these are the same guys, and it mentions their names. It's Annas, it's Caiaphas. It's the same people that crucified Jesus Christ. Now he's talking to them. It's the same people. Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, and he's talking to the people. They did it. Right? It's actually them. <clears throat> whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand here before you all. He's just rubbing salt in that wound. And he's willing to do it. He's willing to fly. Acts 10 34. This is great only because then Peter opened his mouth and says, in the truth, I can see the God of respect of persons. I only included that because Peter was instrumental in the Gentile believers coming into the Christian fellowship. Acts 10 is when that first happened in the Corinthians. And Peter is the one who gives the vision. You know, that which God has planned is called out that one common. And then he goes and Cornelius and household are saved. That's Peter. Um, uh, this is a great record at the end. It's just a fabulous record. Uh, um, we're going to read. Let's, let's read the one in, in Acts 12. Uh, no, it's too long. Yeah, it's too long. Uh, in Acts 12, Peter is imprisoned. Um, Herod, it's a different Herod than the one we read about early in Matthew. It's not Herod the Great. It's a later Herod. Anyway, he kills uh, uh, James and John, you know, the two apostles. He kills James. Right? It's not the Lord's brother, it's the James of James and John. So he kills James, and when he saw that that pleased the Jews, he takes Peter and he imprisons him too. He puts him in prison between what are, in the King James, it's called four quaternions of soldiers. That's four groups of four. And it says in the record that he's bound between two soldiers with two chains. And he's sleeping in prison. And an angel comes in and Spring gets it out. And he ends up at, believe it or not, Mark, John, the Mark that wrote the gospel, he ends up at Mark's house where they're praying for him. And a lady, a woman named, a believer named Rhoda, he knocks on the door. A woman named Rhoda answers the door, sees that it's Peter, doesn't believe it, goes back and tells everybody, it's Peter. They all say to her, you're crazy. Now, mind you, they're praying for him right then. She, she goes back, and it's Peter, and he comes in. It's just an amazing book. 
So I encourage you to read that because, again, that's formative. And that's Peter leading the early church. Right? All the way up, not quite to Acts 15 with um, the first church council, which happens in like 20 years after the death and resurrection of, of Christ. Peter is the leader of the church. These kinds of things are happening in the history of the church in Jerusalem. This is the, and these are all formative for Peter until we get to the first and second. But we won't read that whole record. I do encourage you to read it. It's a great record. Just to give you an idea of time frame wise, um, but most people they seem to date first and second Peter sometime around like 60 or a little after. And again, just to give you an idea, probably near the end of Peter's life, first and second Peter were written. And um, it says, I'll, I just mentioned this to you. This is not a map of New Testament times. It's the Babylonian Empire. But it's the only one I could find that had Babylon on it, which is right there. You can see that it's about the same latitude as Jerusalem, except it's right on the river Euphrates. Right? So it's way... Now, what I want to remind you of, we, we studied Ezra and Nehemiah in our Bible study, in, here, in the event study. Remember, Babylon is when they were carried away to by Nebuchadnezzar. Right? They all go to Babylon. right? And we read in Ezra about Cyrus, who, you know, of the Median Empire, he says, he has the city, he sends them all back. Okay, let's go build the temple and you build the wall. And it documents in Ezra 2, and we read it, it documents how many people went back. It was 43,000, I read it again today, it was 43,360, or something like that, right? They came back. It specifically says, of this family, this family, of this family, this family. And then the end, they summarize. Now, remember, we're talking about, they were there for 70 years. And the whole nation of Israel was carried away there. So there were a whole lot more than 40,000 people there. Plus the fact that whoever was there, they had 70 years to reproduce and grow. But 43,000 of them come back, right? But a whole bunch stay in Babylon. It is from Babylon where Peter writes the epistle. It says it in chapter 5. He's in Babylon when he writes the And the reason is Peter, and Paul talks about this in Galatians too. Peter was what he calls the the um, apostle to the circumcision, the Jewish believer, right? And he ends up not in Jerusalem anymore, but over in Babylon, ministering over there. And that's from where he writes First and Second Peter. Silvanus, the same Silas, the same guy that worked with Paul, he's the one that carries the epistle. And um, we didn't specifically read the address label, but so on this map, uh, actually, let's just look at. First Peter. Or and if anyone has it, you can get up the whole meeting. But first Peter in chapter one, we'll just look at to whom this is actually written. And it says, To the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, it's right here, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. If you can see all of them, is right there, Pontus, Cappadocia, Galatia, and the whole region of Asia is the kind of Asia Minor. So that's where he's writing the epistle to. Um, you may remember from the book, or the record of the um, day of Pentecost, when it says all the Jews from all over the known world were in Jerusalem at the time. Cappadocia, Pontus, and, um, and Asia as regions there where Jews had come to Jerusalem for the feast are specifically mentioned. Galatia, we know Paul had churches there and wrote an epistle to them. Interestingly, Bithynia is of the areas that he addressed the epistle to. If you, I don't know if you remember from Acts 16, but during Paul's travels, it says, you know, he had saved, he attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered him not. So there's never a record of, and there's no record of Bithynia in Acts 2. So I don't know how there got to be Christians there, but there were Christians there. In any case, the other areas, I mean, the, the rise of God's Word, the initiation of Christianity, could have started as early as Acts 2, because they're all mentioned there. The Jews were in Jerusalem. They took speaking in tongues back to where they, they were. Um, now, I don't want to keep you guys too long. Where are we at? Um, I think we're only going to uh, proceed. Sure. Why don't we push the schedule back a week and we'll just teach chapter two next week? 
Well, I'll do two and three. Do two this three. is introduction, I'll do two and three next week. Okay. That work? Um, just because I don't want to keep it too long, but I, I really felt that this background was very important to understand where Peter is coming from, why Peter is Peter, um, and the things that just to think about the things he went through. Whenever we, I read these records, and I encourage you to do the same, put yourself in his shoes. Think about when you were standing on the water and you started to sink because you saw the wind boisterous. And Jesus grabbing you and picking you up and saying, why did you doubt? Or speaking to 6,000 people on the day of Pentecost. Or an angel springing you from prison in Acts 12 when Herod was going to kill you. Again, over and over again, you see just tremendous, tremendous things happening in his life. And his response to that was service all the way to the end of his life. To the point, very likely, tradition is correct, maybe not the type, but to the point of martyrdom, that degree of service. And Joel, I think that's a great idea, so I'll close with prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the word, we thank you for the records you give us, um, the humanity of the apostles and the disciples and the great characters we read about in God's word, and um, that they made mistakes. That they weren't perfect, that we can learn from those mistakes and hopefully not make the same, but be bold. Be willing to jump in with both feet like we see Peter so many times do. Thank you for these men, for their time, for tonight. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.